Okay, uh, now welcome back. Um, so now I would like to introduce you to our guest lecturer, Professor Yasser Ola, who is joining us live from Canada to deliver a guest presentation on the topic, the Quran and Makassid. Professor Jasser Ola is a scholar of Islam whose scholarship has focused on an objective-based uh, approach to the understanding of the Quran and prophetic traditions. He is currently the president of Makassid Institute, an international network of research centers and educational projects. A professor and Al Shatibi chair of, of Makassid Studies at the International Peace College in South Africa and the editor in chief of the Journal of Contemporary Makassid Studies. He is a member of the European Council for Fatwa and Research, a member of, of the FIC Council of North America, and a founding chairman of the Canadian FIC Council. Previously, he worked as a professor at the Universities of Waterloo, Ryerson and Carlton in Canada, Alexandria University, Alexandria University in Egypt, Faculty of Islamic Studies in Qatar, American University of Sharjah in UAE, and University of Brunei Dar es Salaam in Brunei. He is also a founding director of Al Makassid Research Centre at Al Furqan Islamic Heritage Foundation UK, a founding deputy director of the Centre for Islamic Legislation and Ethics in Qatar, and a fellow of the Islamic Fiqh Academy in India. Early in his life, he memorized the Quran and undertook traditional studies at the study at the, at the study circles of Al Azhar Mosque in Cairo, Egypt, where he learned from a number of distinguished scholars of Quran, Hadith, and Fiqh. Professor Aula has lectured on Islam in many countries across the world and has authored 25 books in Arabic and English, including the best-selling Maghasid Al-Sharia, A Beginner's Guide, which has been translated into 30 languages. We are absolutely uh, delighted and it's a real privilege to have you here with us, uh, Professor. Assalamu alaikum and welcome. Inshallah, alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Thank you so much. How are you today? Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Love this. Okay, so uh, what I'll do without further ado, I'll hand over to you. Oh, mashallah. Am I able to share a screen eventually? Uh, yes, I am. Excellent. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah rabbil alameen. Wa salatu wa salamu ala as'ad al-khalqi wa khatam al-rusul Muhammad. Sallallahu alayhi wa alihi. Wa radi Allah an muhajirin wa al-ansar. Wa man tabi'ahum bi ihsanin ila yawm al-deen. Thumma amma ba'd. It is such a pleasure to be here. Uh, Assalamu alaikum to everybody. Um, those who uh, are uh, joining this course on the Quran, I would like to have a special uh, greeting for uh, my dear brother, uh, Sheikh Sharif Hassan Banna, uh, for this course. Uh, reading the Quran is one of the most important and fundamental and foundational actions that we should be doing as Muslims individually and collectively. Uh, the Quran is the source of truth, the source of truth, and any other truth is a truth because of the approval of that book. The Quran is uh, the source of knowledge and any other knowledge is approved uh, from this book in order to become uh, truth, uh, truthful knowledge. And uh, analyzing this book, reading it, and reflecting upon it, and studying it is one of the most uh, actions that's worthy of our times as individuals, as an ummah, especially in this month of Ramadan, which we are celebrating because of the revelation of this book. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless uh, all of you and to accept our very humble eff efforts in this month and to uh, liberate us uh, from uh, punishment. Uh, so reading the Quran is that important, but one of the biggest problems that we have in today's scholarship in terms of reading the Quran is what we can call partialism or fragmentation, or as the Quran puts it, uh, those who fragmented the Quran. Uh, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, you divide the book so you believe in some and you disbelieve in some. Or as the Prophet sallallahu mentioned in the hadith that uh, those who were before you were destroyed 
when they cut the book of Allah and then they made it contradicting to each other. That's the fragments. Uh, so he said the book is revealed in order for its parts to يصدق, to um, confirm, to support, uh, to, to be coherent, to integrate with the rest of it uh, and not to contradict uh, with it. And reading the Quran in fragments and therefore making parts of it contradictory with other parts is a major problem and has uh, very dramatic consequences actually on our lives, uh, our understanding of Islam to start with, and therefore our social, political and economic lives as Muslims, uh, let alone how we deal with the Sunnah, which inshallah will talk a little bit about it uh, during uh, the talk today, and, and how everything in Islam is integrated. The Quran, deals with knowledge in a very holistic and integrated way. The Quran does not divide Islam into these specializations that we divide in order to learn. And there's a difference between somebody who would like to learn Hadith and therefore give some time to the specialization of Hadith and thinking that Hadith is a separate knowledge, is a separate silo from the Quran, let's say, or thinking that Fiqh is a different kind of knowledge from the Quran or the Hadith, or dealing with da'wah uh, or the call of Islam as a separate discipline. Islam is not divided like that. And the Quran does not divide the Islamic disciplines like that. And the Quran doesn't divide disciplines to start with to Islamic and non-Islamic. And therefore, when you deal with history or psychology or sociology or politics or economics or architecture or arts, uh, you deal with them as non-Islamic studies uh, versus the Quran doesn't do that. The Quran deals with phenomena in a very integrated way. And if you analyze the Quran methodologically, which is something I will give an introduction to today, inshallah, then you realize that the Quran is teaching us a certain method of approaching it and then approaching the universe based on our approach of the Quran. So um, let me present today on the issue of maqasid in terms of, I hope I can share my screen clearly. The screen is shared right. Um, in terms of a, a logic, let's make a little bit of a shift in the logic that we approach the Quran with. Uh, instead of, uh, as I mentioned, approaching it in fragments, and thinking about an evidence versus a question. And therefore, to answer my question, I go and look for a verse or half a verse or a hadith or half a hadith uh, in order to answer my question. Let us get into the logic of connectivity as the basic logic of the Quran. If you analyze it methodologically, you will see that it is connecting itself by itself and connecting its parts uh, in, in a holistic way, and it is teaching us to connect everything in the universe. It is also teaching us that connectivity does not work without a reason for it, um, a purpose, an objective for the connectivity. So purposefulness is at the heart of the arguments of the Quran for the truth. Um, why are we created? So that we worship Allah. Why did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala create the mountains and the seas and the wind. Why did he send the prophets and the messengers? Uh, messengers? Why did he, subhanahu wa ta'ala, create even the donkeys and the cows and the camels and so on? Everything is mentioned in the Quran with a reason and a purpose and an objective. And therefore, purposefulness here is not um, coming from the out outside of the logic of the Quran to the Quran. It is at the heart of the logic of the Quran. And quite clearly more than the usual logic of causality that we think in terms of a cause and an impact, the Quran has some of this, but most of its logic is a logic of purpose. And when you look at the Quran in its totality, it's a very highly connected book and it's teaching us to look at the universe in a highly connected way. Let's take an example. I will give two examples today. One from Surah Al-Baqarah. If you look at it, 
uh, trying to integrate what the scholar uh, of, of today, the major scholars who are renewing the Islamic thought of today call the themes uh, or tafsir al mawdu'i or the thematic exe exegesis of the Quran, which is the latest that we have in the Islamic scholarship to go beyond the fragmentation. Now, and let us look at the thematic interpretation in terms of a method that requires development. And I will propose uh, something that goes beyond the thematic interpretation in order to achieve the logic of connectivity and purposefulness that is at the heart of the Quran. So if you look at Surah Al-Baqarah, for example, and if you take, for example, the tafsir of uh, our Sheikh, Sheikh Muhammad Al-Ghazali, uh, uh, and very much impacted by his Sheikh Muhammad Abdullah Draz, rahimahullah, in his book, al nabi Al-Azim, or The Great News, uh, with some modification, you see that the verses are divided into those five themes, introducing the Quran, calling people to believe, calling the people of the book to a straight path, detailing some of the main rules of the Islamic jurisprudence, uh, motivation and, and closing prayers. So the first, let's say uh, 20 verses, Alif Lam Mi, this is the book, talk about the believers, disbelievers, and then the hypocrites, and then a simile for disbelief of both kinds, the disbelievers and the hypocrites. So when we look at those 20 verses, this is introducing the book in the first surah after Al-Fatiha in that way, uh, those who believe and disbelieve and the hypocrites and an example. And then calling people to believe in those five verse, verses, Ya ayyuhal nas abudu rabbakum, O people worship Allah, believe in his messenger, avoid the punishment and uh, seek the reward of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in those five verses. And then you have 120 verses of Ya Bani Israel, uh, Ya Bani Israel, a call to remember for the children of Israel and then eventually the people of the book. Those nine verses, uh, remember uh, the, uh, you, you know, the, the bounties that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given you, speaking to them as one ummah, the people of the book in general, and smaller ummahs under that, the children of Israel, and then eventually the Nazarites, the Nasara, and others, uh, other groups. Uh, stories with Musa over those uh, couple dozen verses, and then a verse that transfers from the history to the current time of Muhammad ﷺ. You have hard hearts uh, like the stones and so on, and then conduct with Muhammad, how they deal with Muhammad وسلم, in those around 50 verses, uh, speaking to the times of Muhammad and his dealing with the children of Israel وسلم, and then Muslims as the inheritors of the true message, starting by the change of the Qibla from Jerusalem to Mecca as a sign of that inheritance of the truth of Islam because Musa at the end was a prophet of Islam and Isa too وسلم, and Sulaiman and Hud and Dawood and uh, in Islam, we don't have these religions. Yes, they, they exist, but they are um, bid'ah, they are innovations. But the religion of Adam all the way to Muhammad is the religion of Islam. So you have those 35 uh, or 30 verses to, to talk about that. Moving on to the main rules, we have those 15 themes, which is the basic uh, premises of, of uh, creed uh, from Tawheedullah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, and the verse of Al-Bir, uh, after this dozen verses of the creed and, and the faith, uh, and then Laysa al-Birra an wujuhakum. And this is, as Sheikh Daraz said, is the heart of Surah Al-Baqarah, uh, the verse 177, talking about righteousness is one, two, three, four, and detailing the righteous ones. Those are the truthful and the righteous uh, ones or the hateful ones. And then there are um, a dozen themes from the Islamic jurisprudence. Uh, retributions in those uh, uh, two verses, and then bequeaths uh, the, and, and the wills, fasting, uh, uh, not consuming the haram, uh, and then after that, a uh, number of verses on the hajj and umrah, and then back to the hypocrites versus the believers, to talk about jihad, spending in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, liquor and gambling. And then we have those 25 verses on the family law, more or less, 
in the stories and the articles on jihad back to uh, talking about jihad, including Ayat al-Kursi, and the prohibition of usury and then deaths. Uh, finally, the surah is uh, giving motivation for worshiping Allah and doing good deeds and closing prayers after the articles of faith, amal al-rasulu bima uzil ilayhim rabbi wal mu'minun, uh, and then rabbana la tu'akhidna in nasina wa akhtana. So if you look at the surah, my point is that uh, the themes, even though we divided the uh, sections of the surah into those two levels of hierarchy, the first level that has to do with the five themes, and then each theme has, let's say, roughly a dozen themes around that, and we divide the verses like that, we need an approach that takes this forward in order to realize that kind of understanding of the Quran and um, make this kind of understanding apply to questions of the current time. Because yes, if we go to the themes, for example, calling people to belief, uh, we can learn lessons from that for the sake of da'wah. Uh, call for the people of the book, those 120 verses, yes, they will benefit us when we deal with the people of the book as a chapter, as a theme, as a topic. But how to deal with the contemporary questions require a much more connected and a much more complex way of analyzing the Quran. If we really believe that this is the book that outlines uh, how we approach issues and how we approach sciences, if we are not going to divide sciences into Islamic and non-Islamic in the secular way, if we are going to consider that economics is a chapter of fiqh and politics is a chapter of fiqh and sociology and architecture and design is a chapter of fiqh, of course, in, in the fundamental premises of that, not talking about the tools and the technicalities, uh, but I'm talking about the fundamentals of any science. Uh, there is no science that is, um, that, that is void of value and philosophy and so forth. So in order to do that, we need to shift the logic into this connected logic. Uh, from the hierarchy of the themes, which is an important step, a great step. Read Muhammad Abdul Rashid Rida, uh, Muhammad Abdullah Draz, uh, read uh, contemporary Ibn Ashur and Wahb al and Muhammad Ghazali and Sayyid Qutb, and those who, um, and of course, uh, Ayatollah Sadr, and those who approach the Quran in a thematic way, you will realize that the thematic interpretation is a step towards. Uh, the application of the Quran to the current questions of, of our current time. But in order to realize that, we need to look at what we call in the Maqasid methodology, the methodological objectives. And Maqasid methodology is um, one of those uh, new research in uh, Islamic studies. Uh, I will introduce uh, later as, as we go on. Um, that we work on in the Maqasid Institute. And we have a Maqasid Research Network where researchers are applying this methodology to questions of economics and policy, questions of medicine uh, and, and, uh, and architecture, questions of contemporary times that require the guidance of the Quran, but the question of how, how can we look at the guidance of the Quran. We look at those seven methodological objectives, which is uh, defining and achieving the objectives, defining and correcting the concepts, defining and classifying the groups, defining and aligning with the universal uh, laws, and defining and realizing values, uh, defining and establishing proofs, and finally dealing with the commands. So those seven elements of the uh, objectives if we look at them as a web of interconnected meanings, then we are able to analyze the Quran in a deeper way. Uh, the themes are very important and we are going to be looking at the themes as we analyze uh, the Quran, but in order to have a holistic and integrated framework, what we call here a Maqasid framework, we are going to have those seven elements and these methodological objectives achieving the objectives, correcting the concepts, aligning with the universal laws, etc., in order for us to have uh, that kind of approach. Let me give an example from the same Surah Al-Baqarah, 
as we read. Alif Lam Mim, ذلك الكتاب لا ريب في هدى للمتقين. So let's take those eight verses and let us apply and see how we can read the Quran in terms of those seven elements of the Maqasid methodology. Uh, Alif Lam Mim, this is the book. So this is the concept of book. And if you look at the concept of kitab in the Quran, it is not just a simple book. It is quite a concept uh, that is full of dimensions. Allah is talking about the book that he has that speaks the truth. Um, the book that you will see in the hereafter each of uh, every one of us is a kitab. Um, we have revealed the book to you. We have given Musa the book and so forth. And if you put the book in the uh, under the, the concepts and then read on, you will find that the book has an objective. And here is Huda, uh, guidance. So now you have an objective and you're connecting the concept to the objective. And in fact, defining the concept according to the objective and according to the connections that will um, come with the concept uh, as you read the Quran. And therefore, the um, purposefulness itself uh, as a logic, as I'm saying, is going to be one of the proofs here that is connected to guidance and connected to the book. Um, so the heedful are going to be the first group that the Quran is talking about here. المتقون, who are the muttaqun? Uh, so much is coming in the Quran in a couple hundred verses talking about the muttaqin and detailing everything about them from different dimensions and in different contexts. And to put the muttaqin in connection with the book and the huda and the maqasadiya or the purposefulness here would be um, a, the, the step forward as we read. Let's stop here and look at iman as a qima, as, as a value, and also as a purpose. Eventually, it's going to be a purpose of some of the actions of the believers, actions of the heart and actions uh, of the body. Uh, and al-iman, of course, is connected to a tawheed. And al-ghaib here is the unseen. That's another concept that defines part of the Islamic worldview, because not everything uh, in our existence is seen and smelt and um, you know gauged by instruments, but there is so much that is unseen. And that is part of that uh, conceptual framework uh, of Islam. <laughs> would be a command here that connects with all of this. Uh, and therefore, um, those who pray and uh, those who spend from our uh, providence, uh, spend in the way of Allah, and the providence would be another concept. Uh, providence, by the way, is, is a major concept as well. And if you connect it to the rest of the Quran and think about this, that you spend from what Allah provided you and that you are kind of giving back to not just the community, to the environment, to nature, to the universe, uh, and that is part of the Iman that Allah is talking about, and part of Taqwa, and part of Huda, and part of the mission of the book. Um, uh, and therefore we're talking now about Al-Wahi, about the revelation. Uh, that's what's revealed to you and revealed from before you. It's a major concept as well, the revelation, and how Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Taala reveals not just the books to the messengers, but also reveals to the bees, and reveals to the mother of Musa what to do and reveals uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala to the fire, not to burn Ibrahim and reveals to Maryam about Isa and so forth. So revelation is a major concept as well that will start to take a place in this Islamic worldview that we are building here. وَالَّذِينَ وَبِالْآخِرَةِ هُمْ يُوْقِنُونَ The afterlife they believe and therefore that is going to be connected uh, from the concepts to Al-Iman here, or, or faith. Uh, uh, again, huda, success here as an objective. How do you define success? What is success? Uh, how do you define the rise and fall of civilizations? How do you define development? 
How do you define achievement? All of this has to do with the definition of success, al-falah uh, in the Quran, because that is the Islamic definition of success. Uh, and then our definitions of the rise and fall of anything is supposed to be tied to that concept uh, of success and objective uh, of success. Uh, and then we, uh, we can infer a universal law here that charity is means to providence and success. And so much will come later about that, that when you give, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala adds to the rizq uh, individually or collectively and uh, causes you to be on the path of success. That is a universal uh, law here. In الَّذِينَ كَفَرُوا سَوَاءٌ عَلَيْهِمْ أَنْدَرْتَهُمْ Now in verse uh, 5, الْكُفَّارِ Disbelievers and believers, المؤمنون. Now we are starting to have groups that Sheikh Hassan talked about in his presentation. And this definition of groups is the Islamic definition. Uh, you can define the society however you like, with the terms you like. But that definition has to be under the definition of groups in the Quran. Because the Quran defines humanity into believers and disbelievers, muttaqoon and fasiqoon and munafiqoon and musalloon and sadiqoon and kathiboon and taghut and so forth. So we'll talk about uh, a lot of that as we go on with the journey. al mu'minun wal kuffar. And therefore, you are now uh, talking about inna ladhina kafar khatam Allahu ala qulubihim. Allah has put a seal on their hearts. And the concept of heart is quite a complex and multidimensional concept that requires a lot of research for those who would like to approach questions of the psychology, uh, questions of um, anything related to the human, really, even questions of economics cannot be separated from how our hearts uh, are functioning and how the human nature is. Uh, how do you define the human? Uh, that is a very important part of that definition. And the Prophet ﷺ said, uh, that a heart, uh, if the heart is uh, sound, then the whole body is sound. And if the heart is not sound, the rest of the body is not sound. And he is talking about the body from the Islamic definition, that is the soul and the aql and the intellect and so on. He's not talking about just the genetics and the chemistry. Now, uh, sound heart is a condition for benefiting from the Quran. That is another universal law. And those who are kuffar, the Quran is not going to add to them, those who already rejected the message and decided to go on in the road of mischief. Even if they say we are reformers, Allah is saying, Allah is saying that uh, they, we, we ask them or they are asked not to be mis mischievous uh, and not to corrupt earth. They say we are rectifiers or reformers. They are the corruptors, even if they don't know it. And when you go on with the verses, you start to link wal-basar, the hearing faculty, the insight faculty, and then al-munafiqoon wa min al-nasi man yaqulu amanna. Al-munafiqoon is a major group and a major theme uh, in the Quran. Why? Because not everybody who says they are Muslim are Muslim from the inside. Um, and, and this has signs. Uh, there are hundreds of verses in the Quran, starting with this uh, second page in Surah Al-Baqarah. They say we believe, but they are not believers. And then the Quran goes on in Al-Baqarah and then Al-Imran and the role during the time of the Prophet Sallallahu in uh, some of the defeats that Muslims had because of the hypocrites and so on. And um, Al-Nisa Wal-A'raf Wal-Ma'idah Taban Wal-A'raf Wal-Anfal Wal-Tawbah Wa Yunus Wa Hud Yusuf. Every surah has a mention of hypocrisy. And the, when the heart conceals something that is not showing on what the body is saying and that kind of double character and so forth. Um, if we go on and on, then every verse of the Quran is going to draw part of that picture. Uh, for example, that verse that is called in some of the tafsirs, the heart of Surah Al-Baqarah, uh, righteousness is not to turn your face towards the east or the west, but righteousness, one, two, three, four. If you analyze that with the same, um, this mind map that we are drawing, we will uh, add uh, righteousness, the recipients of the sadaqah, the patient, the honest. We will add mercy and, and freedom, uh, of course, and freeing the slaves, uh, patience, 
we will look at causality with purposefulness and we start to think about that. Uh, we will deal with some of the fallacies that uh, are uh, that, that plague the, the thinking, the logical thinking. Um, we will start to see more talk about the taqwa as an objective, central objective. And therefore, uh, analyzing the Quran this way, yeah, eventually in Surah Al-Baqarah, if we go on and on and add to this mind map, we are really uh, going to have a complex um, understanding of a taqwa. Uh, a taqwa is not just one word and it's not equal to fear or uh, any, any of these partial meanings of taqwa. Uh, taqwa would be translated as warding off evil or heedfulness or uh, th th this has all of these dimensions that if you put in a mind map, let's say for uh, simplification, then you, you can start to see that a taqwa is something that is uh, understood in a compound way. And if we continue with al-qalb, for example, the actions of al-qalb, so many of them in the Quran, what covers the qalb, uh, the heart, uh, and uh, what, what, what's inside the heart and the nature of the heart, and so forth, then you have something of that sort. Uh, if you analyze al-falah, you have something of that sort. And the whole uh, analysis of the Quran and the Sunnah of the Prophet وسلم, as the illustration of the Quran, he was a Quran walking on earth as Aisha said, radiallahu anha, um al -Mu'mineen. And therefore the Islamic worldview will start to take a shape. And that is a, the objective of the Quran in the heart and the mind of the believer. The believer, when he or she reads the Quran, they start to have this, what's called a tasawwur, or the worldview, the framework. How do you describe things? How, what are your conceptual, conceptual frameworks as you build a framework to describe something? What are the objectives that you have? What are the values uh, of beauty and ugliness, the values of benefit and harm, the values of moral and immoral? What are the commands that you follow uh, and you take for given? Uh, and what are the variables and what are the fixed in those commands? Uh, what are the universal laws that you believe are the meta laws that govern the meta laws that we could infer or propose as theories in social sciences or even natural sciences? What are the meta laws that go at a layer above that in order to guide our thinking? This is a guidance as the Quran is saying, what are the groups as we define them? And what are the proofs? And this Islamic worldview is going to uh, be able to allow us uh, to, to deal with contemporary issues. A word here on the Maqasid methodology, and this is a long story, but I will just give an example, as I mentioned, from the family law. Um, you're talking about having a purpose, uh, a purpose of, let's say now, doing this analysis of reading Surah Al-Baqarah, of understanding Surah Al-Baqarah and seeing how we can benefit from it, uh, or a purpose, as I will explain next, of what are the basic tenets of the Islamic family law? What are, how can we understand the Islamic family law in a non-fragmented way, in a way that integrates its values and objectives and concepts in a way that applies to today's time with the changing circumstances? So that would be a purpose that you have. And then you go through a cycle of reflection or cycles of reflection on the Quran and the Sunnah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And the integration of the Sunnah with the Quran is a long story. I just wanna say quickly that the Sunnah would never uh, contradict with the Quran. And there is nothing in the Sunnah that is supposed to go against what's in the Quran. And this whole theory of abrogation and all of that is a theory that is highly inaccurate actually when it comes to uh, the Quran and the Sunnah and what abrogates what, I wrote a whole book on that that you could find with uh, translated in English in the Islamic Foundation in the UK uh, about abrogation and so on. So there is no contradiction here. The Sunnah is a living example of the Quran and the Prophet Sallallahu details that he gives us in the Sunnah are under the uh, bigger picture that the Quran draws about anything, including the family law, which I will give as an example now. Then you build a framework based on these seven elements uh, of the objectives and the concepts and the values and the groups, and the proofs and the commands and the universal laws. And that framework with its complexity would allow you 
to do a comparative study or critical study of the reality. If, if you are a person who applies the knowledge to what's in the reality or with the literature, Islamic or non-Islamic coming from a non-Islamic philosophy, non-Islamic methodology. Uh, and, and that critical study of the literature would be um, organized by this framework. Would be, th that's how the framework is going to uh, lead you to do this analysis, because simply you will compare the concepts that you have from the Quran with the concepts that you have on the ground uh, that people build in their literature or in the reality. You will compare the objectives that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is drawing for our lives and for our action versus the objectives that an organization has or a state uh, says that it uh, strives to achieve. And this uh, gauging of the success and the validity uh, and the legitimacy of uh, institutions and concepts and objectives and the, the classification of groups and values and so forth is very important in order for us to have a genuine and a non-apologetic Islamic approach. Uh, and then we go to a stage of what we call the formative theories. And I find this highly important in order to develop an understanding, a fiqh. A, a fiqh is a deep understanding. Then fiqh has to do with a, a, with a higher level of understanding of the topic you are talking about before you get into the details. Uh, hence, I would like to uh, give you a quick example from the family law. Uh, these charts actually are from this book that you saw in the break, uh, Re-Envisioning Islamic Scholarship, that uh, Claritas has uh, published in collaboration with Maqasid Institute. And what's on the cover here are those seven elements anyway. So the book is all about uh, this issue. Uh, and uh, in that book, there is an example given on the family law. Now, there are hundreds of verses uh, on the family law in the Quran. I will show you a couple dozen here and some of the hadith in order to see how all of this could build a framework that allow us to rise from the level of fragmentation dealing with the family law to the level of the formative theories and principles. And if you deal with any topic, family law here as an, as an example, from the theories and principles to the details and the applications, then this dealing is more guided and is more connected to the values of Islam and the higher objectives of Islam. If you cut and sever the relationship between all of these verses that we will read together now, then you are going to fragment uh, the Quran and you're going to make it as the Prophet ﷺ warned us, contradict each other instead of confirming each other. Uh, and of his signs that he created for you from your mates that you find tranquility in them. That is the objective of marriage. And he placed between you love and mercy. Indeed, these are signs for people who reflect. This is not just uh, poetry, as uh, Sheikh Hassan mentioned. This is not poetry. This is a principle. And a principle that is so important, it should be part of the definition of marriage in Islam. How is marriage defined? You go to some of these books in the later, later times, uh, basically the times of the decline of the Islamic civilization, the past few centuries, basically, and you find definitions that legalize marriage in Islam uh, in a very fragmented way. Uh, you'll find that marriage is defined as a contract of, uh, of a payment for a utility, you see. And, and it, th this definition is wrong, simply. It contradicts with the Quran. Is there a contract in Islam? Yes, there is a marriage contract. But what is the essence of that contract? How we deal with these contracts? Uh, we deal with so many problems these days uh, in terms of family, uh, Muslim families. I live here in Canada, and again, because of the lockdown and COVID perhaps and so on, so many problems. Uh, the families, Muslim families are, are exploding everywhere. Um, now, how do you deal with the issues? What is the law? Uh, are these just legal terms as in, uh, paying, uh, a, a making a payment for a utility, as some of the fuqaha of the latter times said, or is this a love and mercy relationship? And what is connected to that? And how can we uh, judge based on that the rules that has to deal with maintenance and children and so forth 
there are rules, but how do you deal with the rules? How do you approach? That is a question of methodology. So when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talked about uh, detail, uh, the rights of wives with regard to their husbands are equal to the husband's rights with regard to their, to their wives. So uh, and men have responsibility over them. That is part of the Islamic worldview that men are responsible for, for the family. They are uh, leaders. The hierarchy here is not a hierarchy of authority. It's a hierarchy of responsibility. It's how you understand the responsibility in Islam and what is tied to the responsibility in terms of men versus women. And yes, women would be more responsible than men in terms of uh, the children, especially in the younger age and nurturing them and so on. And that natural division is not black and white and is not uh, to, to say that women have nothing to do with public life or men have nothing to do with housework. It's not about that, but it is a guideline for how you can view the family in Islam. So these verses of the fundamentals and the formative theories are supposed to be at the top of our understanding of the Islamic worldview when it comes to the family law. Now, حُرِّمَتْ عَلَيْكُمْ أُمَّهَاتُكُمْ وَبَنَاتُمْ Forbidden uh, to you are your mothers and your daughters and sisters, da, 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 and all of that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has particular rules. And these rules are going to be part of that approach, part of that framework that we built. فَإِنْ طَلَّقَهَا فَلَا تَحِلَّهُمْ بَعْدُ حَتَّى تَنْكِحَ زَوْجًا غَيْرِ If he divorces her, finally then uh, she, uh, there is no sin and there is no burden on them if uh, she, she wants to marry another man. And, and this is also something that has issues when it comes to um, hindrances that are put in women's way in the name of the Islamic law in terms of marrying somebody else. After the idda, a woman can remarry. Uh, then it comes to the children and where would the children go? And we have a dozen ahadith that has to do and I'll show some of that. And when we get into the fragmentation mind and we think that some of the hadith abrogate some others, and we uh, prefer one of the ahadith in which the woman lost uh, the custody of her child when she got married for certain reasons that the Prophet ﷺ had judged versus other women also in the authentic hadith who did not lose their children when they got remarried. Uh, and we did not integrate in terms of how the ayat talk about the custody issues and breastfeeding and so on. With the ahadith, all of them are correct. Uh, for example, the well-known ones in, in the books of fiqh how can we integrate in a holistic way? How can we look at the concepts and objectives and come up with formative theories? That is uh, essential. And this will come. That verse that talks about uh, the rest of the details uh, of breastfeeding and so on, um, of significance here, special significance, mutual agreement and consultation. So many of these things that we go back to the books of fiqh and we see what Imam so-and-so said and Imam so-and-so said, uh, and this is history. This is not the, the, you know, there is a difference between the Quran and the history of the interpretation of the Quran. This is the history of the interpretation. But the Quran is saying, whatever they mutually agree on and consultation uh, and bil ma'roof in the same verse here in a fair manner. What is fair? What is ma'roof? That changes with the change of place and time. Not to the extent of injustice, obviously, some injustices are prevalent in some of the societies, but we are talking about bil ma'roof that does not break uh, the uh, barriers of, of justice. Um, if we go on with the verses, I wouldn't have time to uh, go through them. And the ahadith, uh, here I could, inshallah, leave the, the slides for those who are interested. Um, the hadith of Bukhari and Muslim and the hadith uh, of Ibn Hibban and so many. And we draw this kind of map of the family law and we look at the objectives of mutual agreement, consultation, heedfulness, rectifying earth, etc. all of this as objectives of the family law. And we look at the concepts and we define them properly. And the groups, universal laws, values, proofs, and commands, and we put all of this in a holistic way, then we would be able to uh, have this methodology bringing us to the step of principles, uh, that the ultimate objective uh, in, in Islam is tranquility, love, kinship, education. The rights within families are balanced with responsibilities. This is a principle under which every rule has to fit. 
Uh, men have a primary role of support and women have a primary role of nurturing. And when these things change, the society is imbalanced. Yes, fiqh has to deal with the imbalance in a reasonable way, but these things are the default uh, Islamic worldview when it comes to family law. Uh, marriage could, should be rectified according to what is fair or reasonable, or a peaceful departure according to what is fair or re reasonable. Uh, no harm should be inflicted on husband, wife, or children because of the marriage. Society or court, in that case, intervenes when mutual agreements and conciliations fail. Nothing per permits, uh, through a legal contract, what Allah made forbidden. Uh, whatever you know, le legality and polity you live under, there are things that the law would permit that are haram, and nothing would permit them in terms of the sharia ah that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, made uh, forbidden. There is room for recognition for the cases in which the lawful is restricted by the law. That is a different story. When the law restricts something that is lawful, like a marriage age, for example, um, you know, 18 would be too high, but anyway, we can debate that in some other time. But basically the, the, the initial uh, principle of restricting the law uh, based on the policy, if you wish, uh, or restricting the halal based on what you think is maslaha, is a benefit for the people is something that's also a principle that we should conclude when we deal with uh, the Islamic family law. Um, and therefore something like custody, for example, or related details would be based on the best interest of the child. And that's how we can resolve all the contradictions. And that's how we can avoid all of these theories of fragmentation in terms of abrogation uh, and all of that. Um, basically, this is a very uh, rushed, I hope uh, clear enough, um, introduction to that shift of logic that we need to do in reading the Quran. The thematic approach is great. Uh, journeying through, through the Quran as this course is giving you is great and I really appreciate this step. Uh, my uh, advice uh, from a scholarly perspective is to connect the themes that you are talking about and to connect across the Quran and to read and connect with the Sunnah of Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and to have this as a framework. When you are a policymaker and you read the Quran, you will see different things. When you are a guy who works in the military, for example, you will see different things. When you're an architect, you will read the Quran in a, with different eyes. Uh, and uh, you are not going to give fatwa in the family law if you are an architect, but you are supposed to give fatwas in the architectural issues, uh, not necessarily fatwas of haram and wajib, uh, oblig obligation and let's say forbiddens, but uh, fatwas that have to do with how can the architecture that we developed uh, with, with modernity and post-modernity, how can we take an Islamic approach to that? Uh, instead of apologizing uh, to, uh, uh, for the, the, the current way of dealing with uh, people as, as uh, objects, uh, as, as the architectural theories are actually proposing uh, for us, how can we deal with the human from the Islamic point of view, uh, non, in, in a non-Freudian way, if we're going to build an Islamic psychology, and uh, in a non-homo uh, economicus way, if we're going to build an Islamic economy, and in a non-Darwinian um, way, if we're going to build an Islamic anthropology. And we cannot really break these barriers and go there if we do not take the Quran in its holistic uh, nature and its connective nature, its purposeful nature, كل قول هذا استغفر الله لي ولكم جزاكم الله خير السلام عليكم ورحمة الله. Thank you, Salam Abdullah. Thank you very much, Jazakallah, Professor Oda. Uh, that was so fascinating and just really so thoughtful, thought provoking. Um, we have a, a few minutes. I can't see that we have any specific questions from any uh, of our. Okay, there is a few now, so I, I may put them to you if that's okay, Professor. Yeah. Um, on the chat, I put my email as well. Uh, I mean, the Maqasid Institute email uh, for people who would like to connect. Okay, yeah, I mean, I can, um, we, we can share that afterwards, maybe. I'll, I'll, I'll read these out to you. Um, yeah, please go ahead. Please go ahead. Yeah, Salam Sheikh, fascinating approach to the Quran, uh, to the study of the Quran. Um, have you, and is it appropriate to apply the framework to chapters of the Quran and then gain a favor of the surah through assessing the occurrences of each component of the framework to verses in it. 
For example, certain suras have more verses on ob objectives as opposed to concepts. Jazakallah uh, khair. The, um, the weight of an element uh, or a meaning in the Quran is not necessarily linked to how many times it is mentioned. Uh, yes, it's true that taqwa is mentioned a couple hundred times, uh, but it, 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 it is a central concept. But sharia ah is mentioned three times, and it's very important. Uh, and maybe a deen is mentioned less times than taqwa, but deen is very central. So the centrality of the concept here is not necessarily tied to the recurrence, but rather tied to how it is mentioned. Uh, if it is connected to the highest of the objectives, which is ibadatullah or the tawheed of Allah, if something is going to be shirk, for example, or associating somebody with Allah, even if it's mentioned once, it becomes very important because it goes against the tawheed, which is at the heart of, the, uh, of that network that we build. So the centrality of the meanings are not tied necessarily to the number of recurrences, but rather to how connected they are to the articles of faith and the articles of law, the basic arcan or pillars of faith and law. Okay, Zakar, thank you very much. Um, I've got one more question too, if that's okay. Um, at what point do we say we as a collective have understood the Quran for implementation to achieve social and civic change as well as personal and family change? Well, this is a journey that never ends. Uh, we cannot say that we uh, understood the Quran, you know, we, but, but we have to uh, break the barrier of Muslims not reading the Quran and not reading the Quran seriously, like not reading the Quran and thinking of their own worldview and their own profession and their own what they do in life. And um, you can say that you are starting to understand the Quran if the Quran has a meaning in your life more than the rituals. Because the, because the rituals themselves are means to an end. We read the Quran for the Slah al for the rectification of earth. We pray for Tanha al Fahshay al Munk to avoid ugliness and, uh, and the evil deeds. And, and we, we kind of ritualized uh, the reading of the Quran too much. Uh, and we make, uh, sometimes you see people who read the Quran, but their life has nothing to do with the Quran. Not, not the way they deal with families or the environment or, you know, truth and power or any of this. Like they just, they go on with the good old riba kind of way doing life. But once the Quran has a meaning in your life more than the rituals, then you can start to say that you have some fiqh or understanding of the Quran. But the fiqh never ends. And it's, it's, so, it's so much. Uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made this book open. Imam Ali radiallahu anhu, uh, and he is who he is in Islam. He said, uh, maybe one person will come and understand in the Quran things that we don't understand. And every generation will have those people who will come and understand things that the Sahaba, uh, and the, the caliber of Imam Ali, and the Sahaba did not understand. They say, because they learned that. They learned that this book is high and uh, it, 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 the tafsir never ended. The Prophet والسلام, that's one of the wisdoms he did not give us a full tafsir. He did not sit with the companions and say, Alif Lam Mim this, this, because he wanted to leave it open. He would only live the Quran and leave us to live it generation after generation. Thank you so much. I think just like that, that's a, such a beautiful answer and probably a really uh, an apt way for us to wrap things up because we've run out of time now. But I kind of leads into the fact that we want, we've been on this journey together uh, today as well. Um, and we've all kind of benefited so much and learned so much about the Quran and we'll carry on that journey, inshallah. Um, so I'm actually pleased to share with you all that in partnership with Makassid Institute, IIDR will be hosting a one day course on Professor Jasser Oda's new book, uh, Re Envisioning Islamic Scholarship Makassid Methodology as a New Approach. I think it's the one where you showed us the cover. Uh, look out for the dates and details on the IIDR website soon. That's IIDR.org. Uh, as for today's recording access link, this will be posted on our course web page within 24 hours, or you can get the extended recording access at IIDR.org. Uh, if I may, I would now like to pass back to you, Professor, uh, to end the day with a du'a. Allah, 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 Allah,
وذكرنا منه ما نسينا وارزقنا تلاوته على النحو الذي يرضيك عنا ربنا لا تؤاخذنا ان نسينا واخطانا ربنا ولا تحمل علينا اسرا كما حملته على الذين من قبلنا ربنا ولا تحملنا ما لا طاقه لنا به واعف عنا اللهم انا نسالك علما نافعا وقلبا خاشعا ونورا ساطعا ورزقا واسعا وشفاء من كل داء وغنيمة من كل بر ونجاة من كل إثم وتوبة من كل ذنب لا تدع لنا ذنبا إلا غفرته ولا عيبا إلا سترته ولا هما إلا فرجته ولا مريضا إلا شفيته ولا مبتلا إلا عفيته ولا أسيرا في سبيلك إلا فككته ولا مجاهدا في سبيلك إلا نصرته ولا حاجة هي لك رضا ولنا فيها صلاح إلا قضيتها يا كريم اللهم إنا نعوذ برضاك من سخطك ونعوذ بعفوك من عقوبتك ونعوذ بك منك لا نحصي ثناء عليك أنت كما أثنيت على نفسك اللهم إنك عفو كريم تحب العفو فاعف عنا اللهم إنك عفو كريم تحب العفو فاعف عنا اللهم إنك عفو كريم تحب العفو فاعف عنا صلى الله على محمد النبي الأمي وآله الله Thank you very much everyone see you same time tomorrow إن شاء الله بارك الله خير بارك الله فيك أخي بالبين تاتش إن شاء الله Thank you very much professor جزاك الله خير سلامات وشيخ حسن إن شاء الله جزاك الله خير السلام <تصفيق> 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 <تصفيق>